The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 11, Side 1. Persian legend tells how many hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, a great prophet appeared in Aryana Vaijo, the ancient home of the Aryans. His people called him Zarathustra, but the Greeks, who could never bear the orthography of the barbarians patiently, called him Zoroastres. His conception was divine. His guardian angel entered into an haoma plant and passed with its juice into the body of a priest as the latter offered divine sacrifice. At the same time a ray of heaven's glory entered the bosom of a maid of noble lineage. The priest espoused the maid, the imprisoned angel mingled with the imprisoned ray, and Zarathustra began to be. He laughed aloud on the very day of his birth, and the evil spirits that gather around every life fled from him in tumult and terror. Out of his great love for wisdom and righteousness, he withdrew from the society of men and chose to live in a mountain wilderness on cheese and the fruits of the soil. The devil tempted him, but to no avail. His breast was pierced with the sword, and his entrails were filled with molten lead. He did not complain, but clung to his faith in Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Light, as supreme God. Ahura Mazda appeared to him and gave into his hands the Avesta, or Book of Knowledge and Wisdom, and bade him preach it to mankind. For a long time all the world ridiculed and persecuted him, but at last a high prince of Iran, Vishtaspa, or Histaspes, heard him gladly and promised to spread the new faith among his people. Thus was the Zoroastrian religion born. Zarathustra himself lived to a very old age, was consumed in a flash of lightning, and ascended into heaven. We cannot tell how much of his story is true. Perhaps some Josiah discovered him. The Greeks accepted him as historical and honored him with an antiquity of fifty-five hundred years before their time. Barossus the Babylonian brought him down to 2000 B.C. Modern historians, when they believe in his existence, assign to him any century between the 10th and the 6th before Christ. When he appeared among the ancestors of the Medes and the Persians, he found his people worshipping animals, ancestors, the earth, and the sun, in a religion having many elements and deities in common with the Hindus of the Vedic age. The chief divinities of this pre-Zoroastrian faith were Mithra, god of the sun, and Anaita, goddess of fertility and the earth, and Haoma, the bull-god who, dying, rose again, and gave mankind his blood as a drink that would confer immortality. Him the early Iranians worshipped by drinking the intoxicating juice of the Haoma herb found on their mountain slopes. Zarathustra was shocked at these primitive deities and this Dionysian ritual. He rebelled against the magi, or priests, who prayed and sacrificed to them, and with all the bravery of his contemporaries Amos and Isaiah, he announced to the world one god, here Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Light and Heaven, of whom all other gods were but manifestations and qualities. Perhaps Darius I, who accepted the new doctrine, saw in it a faith that would both inspire his people and strengthen his government. From the moment of his accession, he declared war upon the old cults and the Magian priesthood, and made Zoroastrianism the religion of the state. The Bible of the new faith was the collection of books in which the disciples of the Master had gathered his sayings and his prayers. Later followers called these books Avesta. By the error of a modern scholar, they are known to the Occidental world as the Zend Avesta. The contemporary non-Persian reader is terrified to find that the substantial volumes that survive, though much shorter than our Bible, are but a small fraction of the revelation vouchsafed to Zarathustra by his God. What remains is, to the foreign and provincial observer, a confused mass of prayers, songs, legends, prescriptions, ritual and morals, brightened now and then by noble language, fervent devotion, ethical elevation, or lyric piety. Like our Old Testament, it is a highly eclectic composition. The student discovers here and there the gods, the ideas, sometimes the very words and phrases of the Rig Veda, to such an extent that some Indian scholars consider the Avesta to have been inspired not by Ahura Mazda, but by the Vedas. At other times one comes upon passages of ancient Babylonian provenance, such as the creation of the world in six periods, the heavens, the waters, the earth, plants, animals, man, the descent of all men from two first parents, the establishment of an earthly paradise, the discontent of the Creator with His creation and His resolve to destroy all but a remnant of it by a flood. 
but the specifically Iranian elements suffice abundantly to characterize the whole. The world is conceived in dualistic terms as the stage of a conflict lasting 12,000 years between the god Ahura Mazda and the devil Ahriman. Purity and honesty are the greatest of the virtues and will lead to everlasting life. The dead must not be buried or burned as by the obscene Greeks or Hindus, but must be thrown to the dogs or to birds of prey. The god of Zarathustra was first of all the whole circle of the heavens themselves. Ahura Mazda clothes himself with the solid vault of the firmament as his raiment. His body is the light and the sovereign glory. The sun and the moon are his eyes. In later days, when the religion passed from prophets to politicians, the great deity was pictured as a gigantic king of imposing majesty. As creator and ruler of the world, he was assisted by a legion of lesser divinities, originally pictured as forms and powers of nature, fire and water, sun and moon, wind and rain. But it was the achievement of Zarathustra that he conceived his god as supreme over all things, in terms as noble as the book of Job. This I ask thee, tell me truly, O Ahura Mazda, who determined the paths of suns and stars? Who is it by whom the moon waxes and wanes? Who from below sustained the earth and the firmament from falling? Who sustained the waters and plants? Who yoked swiftness with the winds and the clouds? Who, Ahura Mazda, called forth the good mind? This good mind meant not any human mind, but a divine wisdom, almost a logos, used by Ahura Mazda as an intermediate agency of creation. Zarathustra had interpreted Ahura Mazda as having seven aspects or qualities, light, good mind, right, dominion, piety, well-being, and immortality. His followers, habituated to polytheism, interpreted these attributes as persons, called by them Ameshaspenta, or immortal holy ones, who, under the leadership of Ahura Mazda, created and managed the world. In this way, the majestic monotheism of the founder became, as in the case of Christianity, the polytheism of the people. In addition to these holy spirits were the guardian angels, of which Persian theology supplied one for every man, woman, and child. But just as these angels and the immortal holy ones helped men to virtue, so according to the pious Persian, influenced presumably by Babylonian demonology, Seven divas, or evil spirits, hovered in the air, always tempting men to crime and sin, and forever engaged in a war upon Ahura Mazda and every form of righteousness. The leader of these devils was Angromagnus, or Araman, prince of darkness and ruler of the netherworld, prototype of that busy Satan whom the Jews appear to have adopted from Persia and bequeathed to Christianity. It was Araman, for example, who had created serpents, vermin, locusts, ants, winter, darkness, crime, sin, sodomy, menstruation, and the other plagues of life. And it was these inventions of the devil that had ruined the paradise in which Ahura Mazda had placed the first progenitors of the human race. Zarathustra seems to have regarded these evil spirits as spurious deities, popular and superstitious incarnations of the abstract forces that resist the progress of man. His followers, however, found it easier to think of them as living beings, and personified them in such abundance that in after times the devils of Persian theology were numbered in millions. As this system of belief came from Zarathustra, it bordered upon monotheism. Even with the intrusion of Araman and the evil spirits, it remained as monotheistic as Christianity was to be with its Satan, its devils, and its angels. Indeed, one hears in early Christian theology as many echoes of Persian dualism as of Hebrew Puritanism or Greek philosophy. The Zoroastrian conception of God might have satisfied as particular a spirit as Matthew Arnold. Ahura Mazda was the sum total of all those forces in the world that make for righteousness, and morality lay in cooperation with those forces. Furthermore, there was in this dualism a certain justice to the contradictoriness and perversity of things, which monotheism never provided. And though the Zoroastrian theologians, after the manner of Hindu mystics and scholastic philosophers, sometimes argued that evil was unreal, they offered, in effect, a theology well adapted to dramatize for the average mind the moral issues of life. The last act of the play, they promised, would be, for the just man, a happy ending, after four epochs of three thousand years each, in which Ahura Mazda and Araman would alternately predominate, the forces of evil would be finally destroyed. Right would triumph everywhere, and evil would forever cease to be. Then all good men would join Ahura Mazda in paradise, and the wicked would fall into a gulf of outer darkness, where they would feed on poison eternally. 6. 
Zoroastrian Ethics Man is a battlefield, the undying fire, hell, purgatory, and paradise, the cult of Mithra, the Magi, the Parsis. By picturing the world as the scene of a struggle between good and evil, the Zoroastrians established in the popular imagination a powerful supernatural stimulus and sanction for morals. The soul of man, like the universe, was represented as a battleground of beneficent and maleficent spirits. Every man was a warrior, whether he liked it or not, in the army of either the Lord or the devil. Every act or omission advanced the cause of Ahura Mazda or of Araman. It was an ethic even more admirable than the theology, if men must have supernatural supports for their morality. It gave to the common life a dignity and significance grander than any that could come to it from a worldview that looked upon man, in medieval phrase, as a helpless worm, or in modern terms, as a mechanical automaton. Human beings were not, to Zarathustra's thinking, mere pawns in this cosmic war. They had free will, since Ahura Mazda wished them to be personalities in their own right. They might freely choose whether they would follow the light or the lie. For Araman was the living lie, and every liar was his servant. Out of this general conception emerged a detailed but simple code of morals, centered about the golden rule. That nature alone is good, which shall not do unto another whatever is not good unto its own self. Man's duty, says the Avesta, is threefold. To make him who is an enemy a friend, to make him who is wicked righteous, and to make him who is ignorant learned. The greatest virtue is piety, second only to that is honor and honesty in action and speech. Interest was not to be charged to Persians, but loans were to be looked upon as almost sacred. The worst sin of all, in the Avestan as in the Mosaic Code, is unbelief. We may judge from the severe punishments with which it was honored that skepticism existed among the Persians. Death was to be visited upon the apostate without delay. The generosity and kindliness enjoined by the Master did not apply in practice to infidels, that is, foreigners. These were inferior species of men, whom Ahura Mazda had deluded into loving their own countries only in order that they should not invade Persia. The Persians, says Herodotus, esteem themselves to be far the most excellent of men in every respect. They believe that other nations approach to excellence according to their geographical proximity to Persia, but that they are the worst who live farthest from them. The words have a contemporary ring and a universal application. Piety being the greatest virtue, the first duty of life was the worship of God with purification, sacrifice, and prayer. Zoroastrian Persia tolerated neither temples nor idols. Altars were erected on hilltops, in palaces, or in the center of the city, and fires were kindled upon them in honor of Ahura Mazda or some lesser divinity. Fire itself was worshipped as a god, Attar, the very son of the Lord of Light. Every family centered round the hearth. To keep the home fire burning, never to let it be extinguished, was part of the ritual of faith. And the undying fire of the skies, the sun, was adored as the highest and most characteristic embodiment of Ahura Mazda, or Mithra, quite as Ignaton had worshipped it in Egypt. The morning sun, says the scriptures, must be reverenced till midday, and that of midday must be reverenced till the afternoon, and that of the afternoon must be reverenced till evening. While men reverence not the sun, the good works which they do that day are not their own. To the sun, to fire, to Ahura Mazda, sacrifice was offered of flowers, bread, fruit, perfumes, oxen, sheep, camels, horses, asses, and stags. Anciently, as elsewhere, human victims had been offered too. The gods received only the odor. The edible portions were kept for the priests and the worshippers, for, as the Magi explained, the gods required only the soul of the victim. Though the master abominated it, and there is no mention of it in the Avesta, the old Aryan offering of the intoxicating Haoma juice to the gods continued far into Zoroastrian days. The priest drank part of the sacred fluid and divided the remainder among the faithful in holy communion. When people were too poor to offer such tasty sacrifices, they made up for it by adulatory prayer. Ahura Mazda, like Yahweh, liked to sip his praise, and made for the pious an imposing list of his accomplishments, which became a favorite Persian litany. Given a life of piety and truth, the Persian might face death unafraid. This, after all, is one of the secret purposes of religion. Astavahad, the god of death, finds everyone, no matter where. He is the confident seeker from whom not one of mortal men can escape, not those who go down deep like Afrasiab the Turk, who made himself an iron palace under the earth, a thousand times the height of a man, with a hundred columns. In that palace he made the stars, the moon, and the sun go round, making the light of day. In that palace 
he did everything at his pleasure, and he lived the happiest life. With all his strength and witchcraft he could not escape from Mastavahad. Nor he who dug this wide round earth with extremities that lie afar, like Dahak, who went from the east to the west searching for immortality and did not find it. With all his strength and power he could not escape from Astavahad. To every one comes the unseen, deceiving Astavahad, who accepts neither compliments nor bribes, who is no respecter of persons, and ruthlessly makes men perish. And yet, for it is in the nature of religion to threaten and terrify as well as to console, the Persian could not look upon death unafraid unless he had been a faithful warrior in Ahura Mazda's cause. Beyond that most awful of all mysteries lay a hell and a purgatory as well as a paradise. All dead souls would have to pass over a sifting bridge. The good soul would come on the other side to the abode of song, where it would be welcomed by a young maiden radiant and strong, with well-developed bust, and would live in happiness with the Hora Mazda to the end of time. But the wicked soul, failing to get across, would fall into as deep a level of hell as was adjusted to its degree of wickedness. This hell was no mere Hades, to which, as in earlier religions, all the dead descended, whether good or bad. It was an abyss of darkness and terror, in which condemned souls suffered torments to the end of the world. If a man's virtues outweighed his sins, he would endure the cleansing of a temporary punishment. If he had sinned much but had done good works, he would suffer for only twelve thousand years, and then would rise into heaven. Already, the good Zoroastrians tell us, the divine consummation of history approaches. The birth of Zarathustra began the last world epoch of three thousand years. After three prophets of his seed have at intervals carried his doctrine throughout the world, the last judgment will be pronounced, the kingdom of Ahura Mazda will come, and Araman and all the forces of evil will be utterly destroyed. Then all good souls will begin life anew in a world without evil, darkness, or pain. The dead shall rise, life shall return to the bodies, and they shall breathe again. The whole physical world shall become free from old age and death from corruption and decay, for ever and ever. Here again, as in the Egyptian book of the dead, we hear the threat of that awful last judgment which seems to have passed from Persian to Jewish eschatology in the days of the Persian ascendancy in Palestine. It was an admirable formula for frightening children into obeying their parents. Since one function of religion is to ease the difficult and necessary task of disciplining the young by the old, we must grant to the Zoroastrian priests a fine professional skill in the brewing of theology. All in all, it was a splendid religion, less warlike and bloody, less idolatrous and superstitious than the other religions of its time, and it did not deserve to die so soon. For a while, under Darius I, it became the spiritual expression of a nation at its height. But humanity loves poetry more than logic, and without a myth, the people perish. Underneath the official worship of Ahura Mazda, the cult of Mithra and Anaita, god of the sun and goddess of vegetation and fertility, generation and sex, continued to find devotees, and in the days of Artaxerxes II their names began to appear again in the royal inscriptions. Thereafter Mithra grew powerfully in favor, and Ahura Mazda faded away until, in the first centuries of our era, the cult of Mithra as a divine youth of beautiful countenance, with a radiant halo over his head as a symbol of his ancient identity with the sun, spread throughout the Roman Empire, and shared in giving Christmas to Christianity. Christmas was originally a solar festival, celebrating at the winter solstice, about December 22nd, the lengthening of the day and the triumph of the sun over his enemies. It became a Mithraic and finally a Christian holy day. Zarathustra, had he been immortal, would have been scandalized to find statues of Anaita, the Persian Aphrodite, set up in many cities of the empire within a few centuries after his death. And surely it would not have pleased him to find so many pages of his revelation devoted to magic formulas for healing, divination, and sorcery. After his death, the old priesthood of wise men or magi conquered him as priesthoods conquer in the end every vigorous rebel or heretic, by adopting and absorbing him into their theology. They numbered him among the magi and forgot him. By an austere and monogamous life, by a thousand precise observances of sacred ritual and ceremonial cleanliness, by abstention from flesh food, and by a simple and unpretentious dress, the Magi acquired, even among the Greeks, a high reputation for wisdom, and among their own people an almost boundless influence. The Persian kings themselves became their pupils, and took no step of consequence without consulting them. The higher ranks among them were sages, the lower were diviners and sorcerers, readers of stars and interpreters of dreams. The very word magic is taken from their name. 
Year by year, the Zoroastrian elements in Persian religion faded away. They were revived for a time under the Sassanid dynasty, 226 to 651 AD, but were finally eliminated by the Muslim and Tatar invasions of Persia. Zoroastrianism survives today only among small communities in the province of Fars and among the 90,000 Parsis of India. These devotedly preserve and study the ancient scriptures, worship fire, earth, water, and air as sacred, and expose their dead in towers of silence to birds of prey, lest burning or burial should defile the holy elements. They are a people of excellent morals and character, a living tribute to the civilizing effect of Zarathustra's doctrine upon mankind. 7. Persian Manners and Morals Violence and honor, the code of cleanliness, sins of the flesh, virgins and bachelors, marriage, women, children, Persian ideas of education. Nevertheless, it is surprising how much brutality remained in the Medes and the Persians despite their religion. Darius I, their greatest king, writes in the Behistun inscription, Favartish was seized and brought to me. I cut off his nose and ears, and I cut out his tongue, and I put out, out his eyes. At my court he was kept in chains. All the people saw him. Later I crucified him in Ekbatana. Ahura Mazda was my strong support. Under the protection of Ahura Mazda, my army utterly smote the rebellious army, and they seized Sitran Kankara and brought him to me. Then I cut off his nose and ears and put out his eyes. He was kept in chains at my court. All the people saw him. Afterwards I crucified him. The murders retailed in Plutarch's life of Artaxerxes II offer a sanguinary specimen of the morals of the later courts. Traitors were dealt with without sentiment. They and their leaders were crucified, their followers were sold as slaves, their towns were pillaged, their boys were castrated, the girls were sold into harems. But it would be unfair to judge the people from their kings. Virtue is not news, and virtuous men like happy nations have no history. Even the kings showed on occasion a fine generosity, and were known among the faithless Greeks for their fidelity. A treaty made with them could be relied upon, and it was their boast that they never broke their word. It is a testimony to the character of the Persians that whereas anyone could hire Greeks to fight Greeks, it was rare indeed that a Persian could be hired to fight Persians. Manners were milder than the blood and iron of history would suggest. The Persians were free and open in speech, generous, warm-hearted, and hospitable. Etiquette was almost as punctilious among them as with the Chinese. When equals met, they embraced and kissed each other on the lips. To persons of higher rank, they made a deep obeisance. To those of lower rank, they offered the cheek. To commoners, they bowed. They thought it unbecoming to eat or drink anything in the street, or publicly to spit or blow the nose. Until the reign of Xerxes, the people were abstemious in food and drink, eating only one meal per day, and drinking nothing but water. Cleanliness was rated as the greatest good after life itself. Good works done with dirty hands were worthless. For while one doth not utterly destroy corruption, germs, there is no coming of the angels to his body. Severe penalties were decreed for those who spread contagious diseases. On festal occasions the people gathered together all clothed in white. The Avestan Code, like the Brahmin and the Mosaic, heaped up ceremonial precautions and ablutions. Great arid tracts of the Zoroastrian scriptures are given over to wearisome formulas for cleansing the body and the soul. Pairings of nails, cuttings of hair, and exhalations of the breath were marked out as unclean things, which the wise Persian would avoid unless they had been purified. The code was again Judaically stern against the sins of the flesh. Onanism was to be punished with flogging, and men and women guilty of sexual promiscuity or prostitution ought to be slain even more than gliding serpents, than howling wolves. That practice kept its usual distance from precept appears from an item in Herodotus. To carry off women by violence, the Persians think is the act of wicked men. But to trouble oneself about avenging them when so carried off is the act of foolish men. And to pay no regard to them when carried off is the act of wise men. For it is clear that if they had not been willing, they could not have been carried off. He adds elsewhere that the Persians have learnt from the Greeks a passion for boys. And though we cannot always trust this supreme reporter, we sent some corroboration of him in the intensity with which the Avesta excoriates sodomy. For that deed, it says again and again, there is no forgiveness. Nothing can wash it away. Virgins and bachelors were not encouraged by the code, but polygamy and concubinage were allowed. A military society has use for many children. 
The man who has a wife, says the Avesta, is far above him who lives in continence. He who keeps a house is far above him who has none. He who has children is far above him who has none. He who has riches is far above him who has none. These are criteria of social standing fairly common among the nations. The family is ranked as the holiest of all institutions. O maker of the material world, Zarathustra asks Ahura Mazda, Thou holy one, which is the second place where the earth feels most happy? And Ahura Mazda answers him, It is the place whereon one of the faithful erects a house with a priest within, with cattle, with a wife, with children, and good herds within. And wherein afterwards the cattle continue to thrive, the wife to thrive, the child to thrive, the fire to thrive, and every blessing of life to thrive. The animal, above all others the dog, was an integral part of the family, as in the last commandment given to Moses. The nearest family was enjoined to take in and care for any homeless pregnant beast. Severe penalties were prescribed for those who fed unfit food to dogs or served them their food too hot, and fourteen hundred stripes were the punishment for smiting a bitch which has been covered by three dogs. The bull was honored for his procreative powers, and prayer and sacrifice were offered to the cow. Matches were arranged by the parents on the arrival of their children at puberty. The range of choice was wide, for we hear of the marriage of brother and sister, father and daughter, mother and son. Concubines were for the most part a luxury of the rich. The aristocracy never went to war without them. In the later days of the empire, the king's harem contained from 329 to 360 concubines, for it had become a custom that no woman might share the royal couch twice, unless she was overwhelmingly beautiful. In the time of the prophet, the position of woman in Persia was high, as ancient manners went. She moved in public freely and unveiled, she owned and managed property, and could, like most modern women, direct the affairs of her husband in his name or through his pen. After Darius, her status declined, especially among the rich. The poorer women retained their freedom of movement because they had to work, but in other cases the seclusion always enforced in the menstrual periods was extended to the whole social life of woman and laid the foundations of the Moslem institution of Perda. Upper-class women could not venture out except in curtained litters and were not permitted to mingle publicly with men. Married women were forbidden to see even their nearest male relatives, such as their fathers or brothers. Women are never mentioned or represented in the public inscriptions and monuments of ancient Persia. Concubines had greater freedom since they were employed to entertain their master's guests. Even in the later reigns women were powerful at the court, rivaling the eunuchs in the persistence of their plotting and the kings in the refinements of their cruelty. Statyra was a model queen to Artaxerxes II, but his mother, Parisidus, poisoned her out of jealousy, encouraged the king to marry his own daughter, Atosa, played dice with him for the life of a eunuch, and winning had him played alive. When Artaxerxes ordered the execution of a carrion soldier, Parisidus bettered his instructions by having the man stretched upon the rack for ten days, his eyes torn out, and molten lead poured into his ears until he died. Children as well as marriage were indispensable to respectability. Sons were highly valued as economic assets to their parents and military assets to the king. Girls were regretted, for they had to be brought up for some other man's home and profit. Men do not pray for daughters, said the Persians, and angels do not reckon them among their gifts to mankind. The king annually sent gifts to every father of many sons, as if in advance payment for their blood. Fornication, even adultery, might be forgiven if there was no abortion. Abortion was a worse crime than the others and was to be punished with death. One of the ancient commentaries, the Bundahish, specifies means for avoiding conception, but warns the people against them. On the nature of generation, it is said in Revelation that a woman, when she cometh out from menstruation during ten days and nights, when they go near unto her, readily becometh pregnant. The child remained under the care of the women till five, and under the care of his father from five to seven. At seven he went to school. Education was mostly confined to the sons of the well-to-do and was usually administered by priests. Classes met in the temple or the home of the priest. It was a principle never to have a school meet near a marketplace, lest the atmosphere of lying, swearing, and cheating that prevailed in the bazaars should corrupt the young. The texts were the Avesta and its commentaries. The subjects were religion, medicine, or law. The method of learning was by commission to memory and by the rote recitation of long passages. Boys of the unpretentious classes were not spoiled with letters, but were taught only three things, to ride a horse, to use the bow, and to speak the truth. Higher education extended to the age of twenty or twenty-four among the sons of the aristocracy. 
some were especially prepared for public office or provincial administration, all were trained in the art of war. The life in these higher schools was arduous. The students rose early, ran great distances, rode difficult horses at high speed, swam, hunted, pursued thieves, sowed farms, planted trees, made long marches under a hot sun or in bitter cold, and learned to bear every change and rigor of climate, to subsist on coarse foods, and to cross rivers while keeping their clothes and armor dry. It was such a schooling as would have gladdened the heart of Friedrich Nietzsche in those moments when he could forget the bright and varied culture of ancient Greece. 8. Science and Art Medicine, Minor Arts, the Tombs of Cyrus and Darius, the Palaces of Persepolis, the Frieze of the Archers, Estimate of Persian Art The Persians seem to have deliberately neglected to train their children in any other art than that of life. Literature was a delicacy for which they had small use. Science was a commodity which they could import from Babylon. They had a certain relish for poetry and romantic fiction, but they left these arts to hirelings and inferiors, preferring the exhilaration of keen-witted conversation to the quiet and solitary pleasures of reading and research. Poetry was sung rather than read and perished with the singers. Medicine was at first a function of the priests, who practiced it on the principle that the devil had created 99,999 diseases, which should be treated by a combination of magic and hygiene. They resorted more frequently to spells than to drugs, on the ground that the spells, though they might not cure the illness, would not kill the patient, which was more than could be said for the drugs. Nevertheless, lay medicine developed along with the growing wealth of Persia, and in the time of Artaxerxes II there was a well-organized guild of physicians and surgeons, whose fees were fixed by law, as in Hammurabi's code, according to the social rank of the patient. Priests were to be treated free. And just as among ourselves the medical novice practices for a year or two, as in turn, upon the bodies of the immigrant and the poor, so among the Persians a young physician was expected to begin his career by treating infidels and foreigners. The Lord of Light himself had decreed it. O maker of the material world, thou holy one, if a worshipper of God wish to practice the art of healing, on whom shall he first prove his skill? On the worshippers of Ahura Mazda, or on the worshippers of the Divas, the evil spirits? Ahura Mazda made answer and said, On worshippers of the divas shall he prove himself rather than on worshippers of God. If he treat with the knife a worshipper of the divas and he die, if he treat with the knife a second worshipper of the divas and he die, if he treat with the knife a third worshipper of the divas and he die, he is unfit for ever and ever. Let him never attend any worshipper of God. If he treat with the knife a worshipper of the divas and he recover, if he treat with the knife a second worshipper of the divas, and he recover, if he treat with the knife a third worshipper of the divas, and he recover, then he is fit for ever and ever. He may at his will treat worshippers of God and heal them with the knife. Having dedicated themselves to empire, the Persians found their time and energies taken up with war, and, like the Romans, depended largely upon imports for their art. They had a taste for pretty things, but they relied upon foreign or foreign-born artists to produce them, and upon provincial revenues to pay for them. They had beautiful homes and luxuriant gardens, which sometimes became hunting parks or zoological collections. They had costly furniture, tables plated or inlaid with silver or gold, couches spread with exotic coverlets, floors carpeted with rugs resilient in texture and rich in all the colors of earth and sky. They drank from golden goblets and adorned their tables or their shelves with vases turned by foreign hands. They liked song and dance, and the playing of the harp, the flute, the drum, and the tambourine. Jewelry abounded, from tiaras and earrings to golden anklets and shoes. Even the men flaunted jewels on necks and ears and arms. Pearls, rubies, emeralds, and lapis lazuli came from abroad, but turquoise came from the Persian mines and contributed the customary material for the aristocrat's signet ring. Gems of monstrous and grotesque form copied the supposed features of favorite devils. The king sat on a golden throne covered with golden canopies upheld with pillars of gold. Only in architecture did the Persians achieve a style of their own. Under Cyrus, Darius I, and Xerxes I, they erected tombs and palaces which archaeology has very incompletely exhumed. And it may be that those prying historians, the pick and the shovel, will in the near future raise our estimate of Persian art. At Pasargadi, Alexander spared for us, with characteristic graciousness, the tomb of Cyrus I. The caravan road now crosses the bare platform that once bore the palaces of Cyrus and his mad son. Of these, nothing survives except a few broken columns here and there, or a door jam bearing the features of Cyrus in bas-relief. Nearby on the plain is the tomb, 
showing the wear of twenty-four centuries, a simple stone chapel, quite Greek in restraint and form, rising to some thirty-five feet in height upon a terraced base. Once, surely, it was a loftier monument with some fitting pedestal. Today it seems a little bare and forlorn, having the shape but hardly the substance of beauty. The cracked and ruined stones merely chasten us with the quiet permanence of the inanimate. Far south at Nakshi Rustam, near Persepolis, is the tomb of Darius I, cut like some Hindu chapel into the face of the mountain rock. The entrance is carved to simulate a palace façade, with four slender columns about a modest portal. Above it, as if on a roof, figures representing the subject peoples of Persia support a dais on which the king is shown worshipping Ahura Mazda and the moon. It is conceived and executed with aristocratic refinement and simplicity. The rest of such Persian architecture as has survived the wars, raids, thefts, and weather of two millenniums is composed of palace ruins. At Ecbatana, the early kings built a royal residence of cedar and cypress, plated with metal, which still stood in the days of Polybius, circa 150 B.C., but of which no sign remains. The most imposing relics of ancient Persia, now rising day by day out of the grasping and secretive earth, are the stone steps, platform, and columns at Persepolis. For there each monarch from Darius onward built a palace to defer the oblivion of his name. The great external stairs that mounted from the plain to the elevation on which the buildings rested were unlike anything else in architectural records, derived, presumably, from the flights of steps that approached and encircled the Mesopotamian ziggurats, they had nevertheless a character specifically their own, so gradual in ascent and so spacious that ten horsemen could mount them abreast. They must have formed a brilliant approach to the vast platform, twenty to fifty feet high, fifteen hundred feet long, and one thousand feet wide, that bore the royal palaces. Underneath the platform ran a complicated system of drainage tunnels, six feet in diameter, often drilled through the solid rock. Where the two flights of steps, coming from either side, met at their summit, stood a gateway or propyleum, flanked by winged and human-headed bulls in the worst Assyrian style. At the right stood the masterpiece of Persian architecture, the Chehil Minar, or Great Hall of Xerxes I, covering, with its roomy antechambers, an area of more than a hundred thousand square feet, vaster, if size mattered, than vast Karnak or any European cathedral except Milan's. Another flight of steps led to this Great Hall. These stairs were flanked with ornamental parapets, and their supporting sides were carved with the finest bas-reliefs yet discovered in Persia. Thirteen of the once seventy-two columns of Xerxes' palace stand among the ruins, like palm trees in some desolate oasis. And these marble columns, though mutilated, are among the nearly perfect works of man. They are slenderer than any columns of Egypt or Greece, and rise to the unusual height of sixty-four feet. Their shafts are fluted with forty-eight small grooves. Their bases resemble bells overlaid with inverted leaves. Their capitals, for the most part, take the form of floral, almost ionic volutes, surmounted by the forequarters of two bulls or unicorns, upon whose necks, joined back to back, rested the crossbeam or architrave. This was surely of wood, for such fragile columns so wide apart could hardly have supported a stone entablature. The door jams and window frames were of ornamented black stone that shone like ebony. The walls were of brick, but they were covered with enameled tiles painted in brilliant panels of animals and flowers. The columns, pilasters, and steps were of fine white limestone or hard blue marble. Behind or east of this Jehil Minar rose the hall of a hundred columns. Nothing remains of it but one pillar and the outlines of the general plan. Possibly these palaces were the most beautiful ever erected in the ancient or modern world. At Susa, the Artaxerxes I and II built palaces of which only the foundations survive. They were constructed of brick, redeemed by the finest glazed tiles known. From Susa comes the famous frieze of the archers, probably the faithful immortals who guarded the king. The stately bowmen seem dressed rather for court ceremony than for war. Their tunics resound with bright colors, their hair and beards are wondrously curled, their hands bear proudly and stiffly their official staffs. In Susa, as in the other capitals, painting and sculpture were dependent arts, serving architecture, and the statuary was mostly the work of artists imported from Assyria, Babylonia, and Greece. One might say of Persian art, as perhaps of nearly every art, that all the elements of it were borrowed. The tomb of Cyrus took its form from Lydia, the slender stone columns improved upon the like pillars of Assyria, the colonnades and bas-reliefs acknowledged their inspiration from Egypt, the animal capitals were an infection from Nineveh and Babylon. It was the ensemble that made Persian architecture individual and different, 
an aristocratic taste that refined the overwhelming columns of Egypt and the heavy masses of Mesopotamia, into the brilliance and elegance, the proportion and harmony of Persepolis. The Greeks would hear with wonder and admiration of these halls and palaces. Their busy travelers and observant diplomats would bring them stimulating word of the art and luxury of Persia. Soon they would transform the double volutes and stiff-necked animals of these graceful pillars into the smooth lobes of the Ionic capital. They would shorten and strengthen the shafts to make them bear any entablature, whether of wood or of stone. Architecturally there was but a step from Persepolis to Athens. All the Near Eastern world, about to die for a thousand years, prepared to lay its heritage at the feet of Greece. 9. Decadence. How a Nation May Die. Xerxes. A Paragraph of Murders. Artaxerxes II. Cyrus the Younger. Darius the Little. Causes of Decay. Political, Military, Moral. Alexander Conquers Persia and Advances Upon India. The empire of Darius lasted hardly a century. The moral as well as the physical backbone of Persia was broken by Marathon, Salamis, and Plataea. The emperors exchanged Mars for Venus, and the nation descended into corruption and apathy. The decline of Persia anticipated almost in detail the decline of Rome. Immorality and degeneration among the people accompanied violence and negligence on the throne. The Persians, like the Medes before them, passed from Stoicism to Epicureanism in a few generations. Eating became the principal occupation of the aristocracy. These men, who had once made it a rule to eat but once a day, now interpreted the rule to allow them one meal, prolonged from noon to night. They stocked their larders with a thousand delicacies, and often served entire animals to their guests. They stuffed themselves with rich, rare meats, and spent their genius upon new sauces and desserts. A corrupt and corrupting multitude of menials filled the houses of the wealthy, while drunkenness became the common vice of every class. Cyrus and Darius created Persia, Xerxes inherited it, his successors destroyed it. Xerxes I was every inch a king, externally. Tall and vigorous, he was by royal consent the handsomest man in his empire. But there was never yet a handsome man who was not vain, nor any physically vain man whom some woman has not led by the nose. Xerxes was divided by many mistresses and became for his people an exemplar of sensuality. His defeat at Salamis was in the nature of things, for he was great only in his love of magnitude, not in his capacity to rise to a crisis or to be, in fact, and need, a king. After twenty years of sexual intrigue and administrative indolence, he was murdered by a courtier, Artabanus, and was buried with regal pomp and general satisfaction. Only the records of Rome after Tiberius could rival in bloodiness the royal annals of Persia. The murderer of Xerxes was murdered by Artaxerxes I, who, after a long reign, was succeeded by Xerxes II, who was murdered a few weeks later by his half-brother, Sogdianus, who was murdered six months later by Darius II, who suppressed the revolt of Teratuknes by having him slain, his wife cut into pieces, and his mother, brothers, and sisters buried alive. Darius II was followed by his son Artaxerxes II, who at the Battle of Cunaxa had to fight to the death his own brother, the younger Cyrus, when the youth tried to seize the royal power. Artaxerxes II enjoyed a long reign, killed his son Darius for conspiracy, and died of a broken heart on finding that another son, Ocus, was planning to assassinate him. Ocus ruled for twenty years and was poisoned by his general, Bagoas. This iron-livered Warwick placed Arces, son of Ocus, on the throne, assassinated Arces's brothers to make Arces secure, then assassinated Arces and his infant children, and gave the scepter to Codamanus a safely effeminate friend. Codamanus reigned for eight years under the name of Darius III and died in battle against Alexander at Arbila in the final ruin of his country. Not even the democracies of our time have known such indiscriminate leadership. It is in the nature of an empire to disintegrate soon, for the energy that created it disappears from those who inherit it at the very time that its subject peoples are gathering strength to fight for their lost liberty. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.